Bird Scrap by Paul Jennings. The twins sat on the beach throwing bits of their lunch to the seagulls. Don't like telling a lie to Grandma, said Tracy. It wouldn't be fair. She has looked after us since Mum and Dad died. We'd be in a children's home if it wasn't for her. Gemma sighed. We wouldn't be hurting Grandma. We'd be doing her a favour. If you find Dad's rubies, we can sell them for a lot of money. Then we can fix up Seagull Shack and give Grandma a bit of cash too. Why don't you wait till we're 18? Dad's will says that we'll own Seagull Shack by then. We can even go and live there if you want to, replied Tracy. Gemma started to get cross. Told you a million times, we won't be 18 for another three years. The last person who hiked to Seagull Shack said that it was falling to pieces. If we wait that long, the place will be blown off the cliff or wrecked by vandals. Then we'll never find the rubies. The inside that shack, I'm sure Dad hid them inside there before he died. Tracy threw another crust to the seagulls. Well, what are you going to tell Grandma then? We'll tell her that we're staying at Surfside 1 camping ground for the night. Then we'll set out for Seagull Shack by hiking along the cliffs. If we leave in the morning, we can get there in the afternoon. We spend the night searching the house for the rubies. If we find them, Grandma will have a lot of money in the bank. We can send in some builders by boat and fix up Seagull Shack. Listen, said Tracy to her sister. What makes you think we're going to find the rubies? The place was searched and searched after Dad died, and neither of them found anything. Yeah, but it wasn't searched by us. We know every corner of that shack, and we knew Dad. We know how his mind worked. We can search in places no one else would think of. I think I know where they are anyway. Well, I have an idea. I think Dad hid them in that stuffed seagull. I had a dream about it. Hey, did you see that? yelled Tracy, without warning. Where'd that crust go? What crust? I threw a crust to the seagulls and it vanished. Rubbish, said Gemma. One of the birds got it. Breed doesn't just vanish. Tracy threw another scrap of bread into the air. It started to fall to the ground, and then it stopped, as if caught by an invisible hand. It rose high above their heads, turned and headed off into the distance. All the gulls flapped after it, squawking and quarrelling as they went. Wow, shrieked Gemma, how did you do that? I didn't, said Tracy slowly. Something flew off with it. Something we couldn't see, something invisible. Perhaps a bird. Gemma started to laugh. A ghost gull, maybe. It's not as funny as you think, said Tracy. It's a sign. Something or someone wants us to go to Seagull Shack. Maybe you got it wrong, replied Gemma. Maybe something doesn't want us to go to Seagull Shack. The wind suddenly changed to the southwest and both girls shivered. Two days later, Tracy and Gemma struggled to the deserted and desolate clifftop. They were weighed down with hiking packs and water bottles. Far below them, the southern ocean swelled and sucked at the rocky cliff. Overhead, the blue sky was broken only by a tiny white seagull, which circled slowly in the salt air. How far to go? moaned Gemma. My feet are killing me. We've been walking for hours. Not far now, said Tracy. It's just around the next headland. We should be able to see the old brown roof at any moment. Hey, what was that? She felt her hair and pulled out some sticky white goo. Then she looked up at the seagull circling above. You rotten fink, she said. Look at this. The seagulls hit me with bird droppings. Gemma lay down on the grassy slope and started to laugh. Imagine that, she gasped. There are miles and miles of clip top with no one around, and that bird has to drop its dung right on your head. Her laughter stopped abruptly as something splotted into her eye. Ah, it's hit me! Stupid bird is bombing us! They looked up and saw that there were now four or five birds circling above. One of them swooped down and released its load. Another white splodge hit Tracy's head. The other birds followed one after each other, each dropping its foul load onto one of the girls' heads. They put their hands on top of their heads and started to run. More and more birds gathered, circling, wheeling and diving above the fleeing figures. Bird droppings rained down like weighted snow. The girls stumbled on. There was no shelter on the exposed windswept cliff. There was no escape from the guano blizzard that engulfed them. Tracy stumbled and fell. Tears cut a trail through the white mess on her face. Come on, cried Gemma. Keep going, we must find cover. She dragged her sister to her feet. 
Both girls groped their way through the white storm being released from above by the squealing, swirling gulls. Finally, exhausted and blinded, the twins collapsed into each other's arms. They huddled together and tried to protect themselves from the pelting muck by holding their packs over their heads. Gemma began to cough. The white excrement filled her ears, her eyes and her nostrils. She had to fight for every breath. Then, as quickly as it began, the attack ended. The whole flock sped out to sea and disappeared over the horizon. The girls sat there panting and sobbing. Each was covered in a dripping white layer of bird dung. Finally, Gemma gasped. Can't believe this. Look at us, covered in bird droppings. Did that really happen? Where have they gone? She looked anxiously out to sea. They've probably run out of ammo, said Tracy. We'd better get to the shack as quick as we can before they come back. An hour later, the two girls struggled up to the shack. It sat high above the sea, perched dangerously on the edge of a cliff, which fell straight into the surging ocean beneath. Its battered tin roof and peeling wooden walls stood defiantly against the might of the ocean wind. Both girls felt tears springing to their eyes. Reminds me of Dad and all those fishing holidays we had here with him, said Tracy. They stood there on the old porch for a moment, looking and remembering. This won't do, said Gemma, as she unlocked the door and pushed it open. Let's get cleaned up and start looking for those rubies. Inside was much as they remembered it. There were only two rooms, a kitchen with an old table and three chairs, and fishing rods and nets littered around, and a bedroom with three mattresses on the floor. The kitchen also had a sink and an old sideboard with a huge stuffed seagull standing on it. It only had one leg and a black patch on each wing. It stared out from one of the mist-covered windows in the sky and the waves beyond. It almost looks alive, shivered Tracy. Why did Dad shoot it anyway? He didn't believe in killing birds. It was wounded, answered Gemma, so he put it out of its misery. Then he stuffed it and mounted it because it was so big. He said it was the biggest gull he'd ever seen. Well, said Tracy, I'm glad you're the one who's going to look inside it for the rubies, because I'm not going to touch it. I don't like it. First, said Gemma, we clean off all this muck, then we start searching for the rubies. The two girls cleaned themselves up with the tank water from the tap in the sink. Then they sat down at the table and looked at the stuffed seagull. Gemma cut a small slit in its belly, carefully pulled out the stuffing. Silence fell over the hut in the clifftop. Not even the waves could be heard. The air seemed to be filled with silent sobbing. The rubies aren't here, said Gemma at last. She put all the stuffing back in the dead bird and placed it on its stand. I'm glad that's over, she went on. I didn't like the feel of it. It gave me the bad vibes. As the lonely darkness settled on the shack, the girls continued their hunt for the rubies. They lit a candle and searched on into the night without success. At last, too tired to go on, Tracy unrolled her sleeping bag and prepared for bed. She walked over to the window to pull across the curtain, but froze before reaching it. A piercing scream filled the shack. Look! she shrieked. Look! Both girls stared in terror at the huge seagull sitting outside on the windowsill. It gazed in at them, blinking every now and then with fiery red eyes. Oh, I can see into it, whispered Gemma. I can see its gizzards, its transparency. The lonely bird stared, pleading with them silently, then crouched on its single leg and flapped off into the moonlight. Before either girl could speak, a soft pitter-patter began on the tin roof. Soon it grew louder till the shack was filled with a tremendous drumming. What a storm, yelled Gemma. That's not a storm, Tracy shouted back. It's the birds. Those seagulls have returned. They're bombing the house. She stared in horror at the ghostly flock that filled the darkness with ghastly white rain. All through the night, the drumming on the roof continued. Towards the dawn, it grew softer, but never for a moment did it stop. Finally, the girls fell asleep, unable to keep their weary eyes open any longer. At 10am, Tracy awoke in the darkness and pressed on the light on her digital watch. Wake up, she yelled. It's getting late. Can't be, said Gemma. It's still dark. The shack was as silent as a tomb. Gemma lit a candle and went over to the window. I can't see a thing, she said. Tracy pulled open the front door and shrieked as a wave of bird droppings gushed into the room. It oozed into the kitchen in a foul stream. Quick, she yelled. Help me shut the door or we drowned in the stuff. Staggering and grunting and groaning, they managed to shut the door and stop the stinking flow. The whole house is buried, said Gemma, and so are we. 
buried alive in bird droppings. No one knows we're here, added Tracy. They sat and stared miserably at the flickering candle. All the windows were blacked out by a pile of dung that covered the house. There's no way out, moaned Gemma. Unless, murmured Tracy, they haven't covered the chimney. She ran over to the fireplace and looked up. I can see the sky, she exclaimed. We can get up the chimney. It took a lot of scrambling and shoving, but at last the two girls sat perched on top of the stone chimney. They stared in disbelief at the house, which was covered in a mountain of white bird droppings. The chimney was the only evidence that underneath the oozing pile was a building. Look, said Gemma with an outstretched hand. The transparent gull is sat alone on the bleak cliff, staring, staring at the shaking twins. It wants something, she said quietly. And I know what it is, said Tracy. Wait here. She eased herself back down the chimney, and much later emerged carrying the stuffed seagull. Look closely at that ghostly gull, panted Tracy. It's only got one leg. It has black patches on its wing. And now look how big it is. It's this bird, she held up the stuffed seagull. It's the ghost of this stuffed seagull. It wants its body back. It doesn't like being stuffed and left in a house. It wants to be returned to nature. Okay, Gemma yelled at the steering gull. You can have it. We don't want it. But first we have to get down from here. The two girls slid, swam and skidded their way to the bottom of the sticky mess. Then, like smelly white spirits, the sisters walked to the edge of the cliff with a stuffed bird. The ghost seagull sat, watching and waiting. Tracy pulled the stuffed seagull from the stand and threw it over the cliff into the air that it had once loved and lived in. Its wings opened in the breeze and it circled slowly like a glider and after many turns crashed onto the rocks in surging swell belief. The ghost gull lifted slowly into the air and followed it down till it came to a rest on top of the still stuffed corpse. Look, whispered Tracy in horror, the ghost gull is pecking at the stuffed one. It's pecking its head. The wave washed across the rock and stuffed seagull vanished into the foam. The ghost gull flapped into the breeze and then flew above the girls' heads. It's going to bomb us again, shouted Gemma. She put her hands over her head. Then two small shapes plopped into the ground beside them. It's the eyes of the stuffed seagull, said Tracy in a hoarse voice. No, it's not, replied Gemma. It's Dad's rubies. They sat there, stunned, saying nothing, and staring at the red gems that lay at their feet. Tracy looked up. Thank you, ghost gull, she shouted, but the bird had gone, and her words fell into the empty sea below.